I am going to bring Liz in. Hi, Liz. How are you today? Hi, Catherine. Great to see you. And great to see everyone. Well, great to hear everybody's in all different parts of the world. It's fantastic. I know, isn't it? Talk about truly global. Truly global. Well, as I said, Liz, I'm going to make you introduce yourself. <laughs> so I don't get starstruck. So do you tell us all uh, your introduction. Okay, so I'm Liz Henderson, an accomplished senior data leader and mentor. I've got um, lots of experience in data from a very long career and a broad experience from leading teams, sitting on guest panels, being a speaker, writing a blog for the nice, last nine years and publishing monthly blog posts, which Catherine has said very positive things about, so yeah. they must be okay. Um, I've, I've got extensive experience across the full remit of data from digital transformation, data migration, building a data culture and all the different elements of governance and management, et cetera, et cetera. And just to add a little bit of dimension to myself, I'm an advanced scuba diver. And I've dived in the Red Sea, the Great Barrier Reef, the Med. Yeah, it's wow. very interesting. <laughs> Is it possible to dive off Copenhagen Harbour? I'm not yeah. sure I'd want to do that. I haven't dived off the UK either because it's so flipping cold. Why would I want to do that? I only do hot countries. <laughs> you need one of those super warm wetsuits. With no. no. Sun's got to be out. It's got to be hot and sunny before I even consider it. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> well, it's lovely to meet you. And I didn't know about the scuba diving. Very interesting. My cousin is a avid scuba diver, but he does scuba dive off the Scottish coast. Ooh. Yes. Hardened stuff. I'm half Scottish and he's fully Scottish. So uh, I'm not. <laughs> they're hardened when they're from up there, you see. I'm a southern softy, if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you are indeed. So, Liz, with less ado, we've had two questions in, as you're aware before the webinar for a couple of people that couldn't join us today, which is Robert and Anne-Marie. Thank you for your two questions that I'm going to put to Liz now. I know you'll be watching this recording later. So Liz, without further ado, your first question on today's session. Um, and also to all the guests, if you see me looking this way, it's because I've got another screen with questions coming up on it as well. So um, please don't be disconcerted. So Liz, there are a number of reports and surveys that claim employee resistance is the biggest in inherent to successful data-driven initiatives. Get that out in one breath. How true do you think this is? And what are the possible reasons for resistance? It's a really good question. And the what, reason why I like it is because it starts to think about the human behavior and the reasons why. If we're faced with any kind of change, we naturally are fearful of it. It's just human, it's natural, it's hormones, and I'm not an expert in that area in any way whatsoever, so oh, please yeah. don't ask me any more detailed questions. <laughs> but anything that changes, whether that's your bus route, whether that's something at home that changes, your routine, or even a new job. So when it comes to data, we're all filled with either fear, the fight or flight, all those instant responses we cannot control. It just happens naturally. But what helps us manage all of that is having an understanding of what the change is and I recently was working with a client and he was having a problem with using a third party and saying his people said they feel like change is being done to them and that's why they're not comfortable or happy we need to do change with people help them understand why things need to change what it looks like the benefits it's basically what's in it for me why should I get involved? Mm. So helping people along that journey. And we all recognize change and respond to change in different ways. So Fred might be, yeah, fantastic, great, amazing. Let's do it now. Sarah could be, no, I'm really nervous about this. It's going to take me some time. I'm not even sure I can adapt to that. Do I have the skills? It's all that nervousness, the anxious, the I'm not sure I can do that anymore. I've been doing this for however many years. So it, it, being sympathetic to people is that emotional intelligence, as far as I'm aware. And yeah, let's, let's care about our people and the way they feel. I, I recognize that so well because I am a self-confessed loather of change. It terrifies me. Um, but I also feel that sometimes it's because when I'm doing something in one way and it's working properly, when somebody tells me to do it in another way, I have this fear, well, it's already working. Why are you making me do it another way? Because it might not work and you'll blame me. Would you, would you recognize that? 
And that's why it's really important to explain the reasons why we need to change. I learned this lesson very early on in my career. I was part of a change program in a big organization um, for office products. And I was carted off every week to a hotel to do a, a one day session. And to be honest, I was in my early parts of the career. I didn't want to do this. All I was interested in was ticking off the things on my task list. That's what I was aiming for. Like I say, early part of my career. Um, when we came back and all the activities had been done, we ended up with a folder. That big lever arch folder full of all the processes and the things we need to do differently got put in the big cupboard at the end of the office. It never got looked at. Nobody ever took it out of the cupboard. They wanted to do all these fantastic things, but actually they hadn't helped anybody change to the new ways of working. And because the systems hadn't changed and because we could continue doing what we always used to do, why would we change? That's hard work. That's effort. I don't want to do that. I want to keep going. And yeah, that was kind of change failure as far as I'm concerned. So I learned from seeing it done very, very badly. Fair. And, and sometimes that's the best way to learn is actually mistakes. Let's be honest about it. Okay. I like that answer. Uh, in one of your blog posts, you know I love your blogs, uh, <laughs> you say data is a people's sport and the change that is required in the businesses to be successful is predominantly on human change. Could you elaborate on this statement? Yeah, I think it reflects some of the points that I mentioned in my last response. Because whenever we want to do anything around data, data is, is the heart of the business. If we think about a, a hot water system and the pipes and the water, we can't run that hot water system without the water in the pipes. You can't run a business without the data flowing across the business. Where it flows, it infiltrates every part of the business. And if you want to change something, even if it's just that small siloed area of the business you want to change, it's going to impact everybody because that data flows entirely across the organization. And for me, saying data is a people sport is if we want to change things, it doesn't matter whether we change the architecture or change the processes, it's people that have to interact with that architecture and the technology. It's people that have to carry out those processes. Okay, we can automate some of them. But it's people decisions and people involved. And that's why I say data is a people sport. And if we're going to change that, it's human change because we want the people to change and evolve and move to the new ways of working and understanding why. And that's how I add and elaborate to that response. I don't know whether that answers that question, does it, Catherine? I think so. And it certainly does for me. And as I say, as you said, the, the question before, it's kind of a, a growth on that. Um, we've certainly done a webinar in the past talking about who's responsible for data. And the ultimate answer is everyone, because it's your biggest asset. You know, even people are part of the data. So, yeah, thank you for that. And Kristen, you have sent in a question. Thank you very much from Copenhagen, where Liz is refusing to scuba dive. <laughs> um, she's saying, let's use a hypothetical situation. There's a company that holds a decade's worth of data but it still relies on a legacy ERP system that has no data quality framework. And any initiative is fiercely resisted by IT users who are unwilling to reinvent the wheel. To make it worse, she's obviously got the situation, to make it worse, there is a huge wall between IT and business users where the latter has to rely on IT teams to manually extract, clean and transform data for any analytics work. You are hired as a consultant to align process teams and structures. Oh, what would be the first things you'd do? Wow, that's a biggie, Kristen. Well done for that one. Thank you. Yeah, that's certainly it. It's like an exam question. It is rather, isn't it? Can you just give me half an hour and I can write all my, <laughs> my plan and my bullets down? No. Nope. I'm going to try and answer that. I'm going to forget some of the elements. So, Catherine, please remind me if I do forget some of the elements. So, um, business and IT big barrier. That is pretty normal. What you often tend to find is that IT think they own the data and they think they control it and they think they can dictate to everybody else what happens with it. Not entirely sure whether that's this case, but the challenge there is working it's together. It's fiercely resisted by IT users, so I would guess that uh, um, they've got the data and they don't want the change, looking at the question. 
Yeah, and I think if you go back to the water and the water pipes, the pipes are provided by IT. The business provide the data that runs through the pipes. Without being collaborative and working together, you haven't got a business. You've got no success. I do wonder where the top sponsorship or direction is, because ultimately we have our business strategy. And our business strategy is how we're going to run the business for the next year or a few years, what the initiatives, what the objectives and what direction we're going to take. Now, from that, data is a key enabler to the achievement of that data strategy. So I wonder if you've got a data strategy, because that would be my first point. What's your data strategy? Have you got one? Yes, no. So as a consultant, that would be the first question you would be asking yeah. is what is your company data strategy? And if they don't have one, would you as a consultant then formulate one before you went any further? Yeah, I mean, there's a few more questions around that. And actually, I did it with an organization. I got approached by an organization directly the other day, a really big global organization. And I must add that all these views are my own. They're not the views of my organization. Um, and I just, my first question was, do you have a day strategy? And they said, oh, yes-ish. I'm like, <laughs> you don't do yes-ish. It's either you have one or you don't. It's like a business strategy. It's a good you one, have... but you've got one. <laughs> yeah, do you have one or you don't? When you go to the bank manager for a loan for your business, do you have a business strategy? Yes, here it is. You can't say to the bank manager, yes-ish. <laughs> so having that data strategy and having it written by somebody senior that sponsorship, that C-suite ownership of that data strategy, the direction the organization needs to go in. Because if you're not getting at that C-level, when it comes to all this change around data, how are you ever going to initiate and move that forward to success if you don't have that senior sponsorship for what you want to do? There's no point, Sarah, who's an analyst in the corner, trying to change the whole business because she's unfortunately doesn't have that influence across the entire business. Whereas the C-suite, that's where you need your sponsorship. So yeah, where's your strategy? Okay, if you don't have one, it's not the end of the world. Start with your problem. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Where can you get the most benefit? So for example, it might be that, I don't know what type of organization this is. She didn't say, I don't think, did she? I don't know. She's just commented that they don't actually have a data strategy. And is it the job of senior management to do a data strategy? So I think from what you're saying, yes, it's the C-suite, it's the senior management, it's that buy-in rather than a consultant coming in and creating that. Mm. Or both. You can do either. But ultimately, the consultant can come in and do it, but they need the support of the business. They need to be able to have access to the C-suite and understand what their ambitions and the direction of they want to travel. They need to talk to the business to gain their views on what their problems and challenges are, what the opportunities are that they see, and then start to put that together to say, okay, here's the vision, here's the plan, these are our top priority areas, these are the quick fixes and quick wins that we can make, and take it from there. It, it's a step-by-step -step process. I often say start small, have big ambitions and a big vision, but do some moderate activity that you can demonstrate. And I liken that to throwing a pebble into a pond. What's that first ripple? Where can you demonstrate success and fairly quick success to demonstrate this can be successful and move on and you can get the investment? Okay. Well, hopefully that answers your question, Kristen. It's, it is a huge question, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it is appreciated. I'm just looking over here. Oh, thanks, and Kristen. You're welcome. Just looking over at the LinkedIn channel here. Okay. Right, so from YouTube. In some organizations, sorry, what's your name? Oh, Robert. In some organizations, especially small businesses, data ownership is on the shoulders of business users. In such a setup, what kind of data ownership setup would you recommend? Absolutely, the business users need to be the owners and the reason why i say that is the business owns the data because they're the creators they're the experts they're the users if you take customer service for example they create the data as the customers ring up they understand the data because they know how to collect names and addresses date of contracts whatever it might be 
because they're talking to the customers. They know what data is needed to demonstrate that customer services are doing the right job. So they are the experts. So why wouldn't you own it? If you've got IT owning that data, well, they're certainly not the experts. So how would that work? But IT, from what you were saying before, you again, you still need their buy-in to get that change but through. IT need to be a service provider, a facilitator of the technology to enable the business to do the things it needs to do with data. So if you think about HR and being a manager of a team, HR don't own your people in your team. They just facilitate that by helping you recruit them helping do performance approval um, reviews, helping you provide training. They are an enabler and service to the business to help your people be successful. So IT, for me, is that technology provider, that enabler, that service to support the business, being good, using Rather data effectively. The finish of the process yeah. as a whole. Sorry, my screen just went black then for a minute. I don't know if you heard that. Um, so rather than be the owner and deliverer, they need to be the facilitator within the business. Yeah. Because I just made a comment of who should be responsible for the data quality. Well, again, I don't know where you would go with that. Um, I would have thought the senior level need to be keeping the good data quality. I mean, what do you think? It's back to accountability versus responsibility. Because a lot of people often use responsibility, but where does the accountability sit? Now, for me, a data steward in the business needs to be responsible for the data. So if we go back to our customer services example, you would have various data stewards in that domain, business function, whatever you want to call it. They are, can either be a full-time data steward or they can be a percentage of a data steward. So for example, it might be a customer service person that spends four days talking to customers on the phone. And one day they take that responsibility of a data ownership, data stewardship of managing the data and doing corrections and checking results and assessing what needs to be done to make it better. The accountability should sit with the data owner in customer services. And that would be either customer service director, head of um, customer services, they're actually accountable to make sure that their team in customer services are doing the right things, making sure the data's good and fit for purpose, the policies and procedures are all being followed and doing the best thing for the business. And perhaps sales in that as well, because sometimes sales is actually the biggest user of the data, and we're the worst inputters of data in the world. I'm Absolute, I think I said it in my last webinar, absolute hands up. It's not uh, It's not something that salespeople are necessarily good at. Um, and yet, it's really, really important. Um, we've got another question from somebody called, OK, here we go again. Interesting name. Interesting <laughs> username. Um, won't ask. Uh, question for Liz. Uh, in your experience, are companies putting enough investment into data strategies and data management programs? Each new system implementation, each migration, etc. So are they investing in data strategies and, da oops, and data management programs, each new system. And so again, yes, how would you answer that? I'm taking that as a technology question because they're talking it about the system. quite technical, doesn't it? Yeah. And I haven't got the stats with me today. I presented on the stats a while, uh, gosh, I was going to say a few weeks back, but actually it's probably two or three months back. Time flies, doesn't it? Um, mm -hmm. So there is huge amounts of investment going in in data. The challenge is that we're not being successful. And I say we as in everybody, we're not being successful. There's Absolutely, we want to invest in AI, in systems, in technology. All that investment has really good intentions to become a data-driven organization. But most of these investments are actually failing to deliver what they want to achieve because they're not getting the, the people and the cultural element on, on point. Yeah. So 
I'm taking from that question, they're talking about technology. Yes, there's lots going on with technology. And most CEOs, yes, let's invest in more technology because they can see that investment. They can see the technology, but they can't see the data, what needs to enable the success of that technology solution to get outputs for your achievements of your business strategy. So yes, technology is great and they're investing in it. And I'm very advocate of great AI data technology for data quality, data management, data governance, et cetera, et cetera. But alongside that, you should always do a data literacy program. But even before that, you need to have your data strategy, your data governance framework. What are you wanting to achieve? Yes, I mean, you can invest as much as you want as a business. You can throw money at things. But if you don't have the strategy at the start as to where you want to get to, then the money's not going to go to any great use or good, is it? And what I would add to that as well is why are you doing it? So, for example, if you want to be data driven, fantastic. But why? What does data driven actually mean to you as a business? What are you hoping to achieve? What are the results you want to achieve at the end of the day? Oh, we're going to be data driven. Okay, fantastic. But how are you going to measure that to prove success? And it's often called the five whys of data, going down that detailed step by step to go from data driven to something you can hang your hat on, say these are the metrics and this is how we define where we want to be and why we want to do this. Okay. I think that's, I think that's a good uh, question there. And uh, I like the answer, but yes, um, investment is banded around a lot. We need to invest more. Invest in what? For what purpose? You only invest in something that's going to give you a return. So if you don't know what the investment is going into, then you're not going to get a return on investment. Okay. Absolutely. What's the business case? Yes. Uh, we've got another question here in, <clears throat> in siloed models where each department has its own data collection and processing system. As uh, so we going back to the silos we were talking about before, what is the most effective way to mat- maintain data quality standards? So I'm assuming from that question that you uh, are in a situation with siloed models that are not linked and they can't actually link them at this stage with the way this question is written. So let's take, take it as I'm reading it. You do have siloed data. You can't bring it together. In that situation, what would be the most efficient way to maintain data quality standards, do you think? I know that's kind of a... I know that you would no, take them out of silo first off. <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't. Oh, really? Oh, go on. Yeah, I've made <laughs> an assumption. I should never do that. I'm an advocate for data mesh and data fabric. And that's not a technology approach for anybody jumped straight in and said, no, that's technology, not culture and people. So the challenge in the past has always been, let's put all our data together in a data lake. A data warehouse, we need to put everything together so we can manage it. How many data swamps have been made? Who owns the data once it's in a data lake? It's all together, you can't, you don't know who owns it and nobody takes responsibility, which is possibly where the ownership of IT came about, which we know doesn't work. Having those siloed domains, functions, business areas is great, but ultimately we need to pull the data together but not physically. So let me expand on that in a moment and let me talk about the data quality. Mm. So I would suggest a federated model, which means you've got the the isolated, isolated is the wrong word, siloed divisions, areas, business functions, whatever they might be, but they're connected. They're connected to each other and they're connected to the center. And in the center, you've got your data office and your data office is responsible for the standards policies it's those guide rails to make sure you're all doing similar things so if you think about taking it right out of the data world and you build a new car you need the petrol pump to be able to fit that new car and if somebody else builds a car you need the same functionality same dimensions for the petrol pump to fit you can't all build different ones So you've got somewhere along the line, somebody set a standard to say petrol pumps and cars will be the same pump dimensions and shape. And that's exactly what you need to do with your data. So setting those guide rails and those standards about what everybody will do and how everybody will work 
So, for example, the same technology. You don't want everybody having their own different technology to do data quality. You want to invest once in one system. And I have worked in organizations where they've had four of everything. You just take a, a potluck pick of, oh, well, I'll use that system today. I'll use that system tomorrow. <laughs> Why waste so much money? Um, so that's the way I would suggest. And it's okay. bringing people together. So taking a representative from each of the business areas and helping them collaborate and understand each other. Because you can't do it in isolation. You need to be talking to each other. And that's why you need to connect all the business areas together with the center as well. So going back to the why I think it's good to be siloed, but connected silos, is because we've got a distributed architecture. And I'm not a deep technical person, but that distributed architecture of ERP, CRMs, finance systems, inventory, forecasting, all the legacy systems you've got, you're never ever gonna have all that data in the right place of the right quality, owned, managed, and fit for purpose at any one point. We've proved you can't do that. We've spent years and years trying to centralize all that data. So let's take the data mesh organizational approach of why I've talked about that federated model, but let's take the data fabric architecture approach of having all those systems come up into a virtualization layer, and then you can access all the data from the virtualization layer for your analytics and insights. And yes, I know that's not easy, and I know that's something you can't do overnight. But if you start to have that vision of where you want to go to, one of my clients is developing a data mesh. Well, that's fantastic, and they're doing lots of things with data architecture, but actually if they have a data fabric vision in mind, their end results, will provide so much more flexibility and opportunity in the future rather than just keeping it very narrow at the moment. I, it's funny, I, I totally agree with you because also within a business, the type of data can be completely different. Therefore, there isn't a conformity. So I work with customers who have their product data and their product data looks absolutely nothing like their sales data, that it's not meant to look the same. You know, the product data doesn't have email addresses and the, you know, the sales data doesn't have product numbers and so actually the way you're talking about it uh, with the silos and an overarch makes a lot more sense because mind you again on analytics in that scenario an overall analytic on the data would need to be on the silos wouldn't it because it's it's not the same data but through the virtualization layer they could access whatever yes. data they needed to do their analytical insights. So we'll take yeah. a bit of finance data, a bit of customer data, and we'll take a bit of this data here. Okay, combine it all together. What kind of insights do we come up with? That's fabulous. Yeah, I like that. Yes, you're quite right. That's me. <laughs> we don't do silos anymore. Yes, you do. You do. <laughs> Connected silos. <laughs> Connected silos. I'm going to have to remember that one. Connected I like it. Okay. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting. Silos themselves are very interesting because I talk to people who are dead against them, and I talk to people who want them completely um, independent of each other for different reasons, for different businesses, and for different purposes. <clears throat> and in some companies, there isn't a right or wrong. No, you know. and th there's never a right or wrong because if you tell somebody one area to share all their data they're still going to have that spreadsheet of data that they keep in their it's dark mine. corner. Yeah, it's exactly. Mine. It's mine. <laughs> so you've just got to, you've got to work with what you've got. You can't change everything. Okay. And we've got a question from Tiffany. We've got a question for Liz. You discussed POD teams as a suggested solution to a large, to larger domains. I think this must be from one of your, blogs Liz what are the pros and cons of this structure and would it be applicable to businesses of all sizes so I'm not entirely sure I'm clear on the question so POD I've, I've discussed pod teams in relation yeah. to data mesh development is that what it's referring to I think so yes you you had them as a suggested solution to larger domains I haven't seen this particular blog, so let I'm me sure answer you what remember I remember if you wrote about that. I can remember. Um, okay. Let me see if I can try and answer that question, whether I'll get the right 
right type of response. I don't know. Let's let's here we go. So for me, taking it back to that it kind of follows on from what we're talking about, federated, siloed, but having pods of experts in each domain. So you've got a data owner, a data product owner, a data analyst, a data scientist, a data engineer. Those types of people are replicated in all the business areas to do the work around creating data products and making sure the data is fit for purpose, that when somebody comes along as an analyst and wants to use that finance bit of data, that customer service bit of data and that insurance data, they know they've got products of data or sets of data that can, can be combined together easily and that they can use to answer the questions they've got or develop the insights that they want to work on. I think there was another part to that question, wasn't there? Um, what are the pros and cons of this structure? And do you think it would be applicable to businesses of all sizes? Okay. Interesting second part of that question, pros and cons. I actually don't think this is where you start. This is possibly where you end up for large organisations. I think where you start is having one pod whether that's a central pod initially, because if you are going down this route of this kind of data mesh product development, you've got the risk that if you put pods in all the different domains, one, it's high cost. Two, there's not enough data people out there to recruit all those people for your organization. We know there's a shortage of data people anyway. Kyle Winterbottom would agree with you. Hi, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> and three, if you've got all these people sitting in each domain, how do you know they're all going to be working hard? Because you're going to have people that's like, okay, well, what do we do today? Because we've got no more data products to create. You're going to have that underutilization risk. How, however, if you just say, right, we're going to have a central pod full stop, you've potentially got that bottleneck because everybody wants their work doing and whoever shouts loudest or whoever brings the box of chocolates or buys the coffee is going to get their... Oh, <laughs> Don't think we do wine at work. Um, <laughs> Someone should have told me that. I don't think they won't get their data product developed. So, again, start small, a small pod of people. And actually, do you need all those six, eight different roles straight away? You probably don't. You Build can probably just gradual. Yeah, absolutely. Build it iteratively. What do you want to? What do you want to do? What? problem are we trying to solve by building this data product always back to the why are we doing this what's the benefit okay and that obviously from what you've just said that's applicable to business of all sizes if you're very small then you need to start with one person in the pod yeah. and grow and a larger business okay um does that answer the question for you properly i don't think yes i think so Yes, POD teams. Okay, cool. Oh, very nice comment from Thomas. Really great webinar this. Very informative and interesting at the same time. Oh, thank uh, you. It's very kind. <laughs> kind. I think Thomas was from London. Very kind in London. Thanks, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> if you could summarise a strategy for aligning culture, wow, people, data, and technology in five steps what would it be now don't cry <laughs> <laughs> a strategy for aligning culture people data and technology yes and you've only got five steps which thomas that's slightly cruel but okay well actually no what's your data strategy in your data strategy you should have a consideration for people process technology and maturing that culture to develop and achieve what you want to achieve in your business so without your data strategy you've got no direction there are no steps to take because no. you can't you get haven't, started yeah you haven't defined what the direction is or what you actually want to achieve with your data ah, see if thomas answered that one uh I'm just waiting to see if he's got to comment on that. So, Thomas, yeah, um, it takes us back to having the data strategy in the first place. Um, question from me, actually, Liz, going just a little bit back on to the original cultural side of things. Um, how do you find 
what is the if the if I could say one thing that you've discovered works the best at getting your team, your staff, your company to accept a change? Is there anything that really you have found works best? I mean, is it workshops? Is it many meetings? How how do you go about it? Because I mean, I'm, I, I've told you, I'm terrible with change. How would you, how would you go for me to say, come on, this is going to work? It's is it communication? Communication is that key point. Yeah. What are we doing? How are we doing it? And how you communicate. So it's not just one method of communication because we all like to receive communication or information in different ways. And I put things forward such as, webinars, one-to-ones, data cafes where come along, have a, uh, have a coffee and a bit of cake in a physical environment or even a virtual environment like this. Come and have a chat to an expert. Share your concerns. What are your challenges? What don't you understand? Have a kind of what of everybody's perceived silly questions. We know there's no silly questions, but let's have a, an hour where everybody just asks a really basic question because if you've got that question, somebody else is going to want to answer it. The lunch and learns, the kind of a data digby. Having a data digby sign, I'm, I'm going physical again, on your desk to say it could be a tent card kind of thing or a triangle or whatever. I'm a data digby. So come to me to ask me your questions. It's how it's having that accessibility so people feel they can ask people what the challenges are and what the issues are and it's just sharing and communicating and helping them understand what's happening and why it's happening, why it's important. And how can we help you be more comfortable with what's changing? And making sure they don't feel that they're going again. Because I think sometimes, certainly in some of the larger organisations I've worked for, I've been to sessions where people walk out going in the session. Yeah, 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 yeah. And walk out going, I'm not doing that. And, and it's because they don't want to say in the session i'm scared i don't like this so they i think that's cultural too making sure that they can say i don't really like this and it's not going to affect their promotion next year yeah and it's having those internal champions we all know we have them in the organization the person that we can go and speak to in confidence because they're an influencer they can talk to other people and find things out being able to speak to those people and get more of a comfort around so if you come out of the meeting oh, i hate this and you go and say tom you got a few minutes because i didn't like that meeting but i know you really understand this can you help me understand it and also having those people that are negative one thing that's really good I, i'm i was just tempted to go political there on theresa may but i won't i'll, I'll stay away from that <laughs> But it's not, do having, it, do it. <laughs> it's not having just your advocates around you. You want people that will actively disagree and challenge you because that makes you think. It's a bit like this. Having questions is like, oh, yeah, I never thought about it that way. It's just getting people to think in a different way to, for the approach. Because you might have your change plan, we're going to do all this, but someone says, yeah, but how do we get to those people? Or they never come into the office or they're in Amsterdam or Co um, Copenhagen or wherever. How do we make them feel part of this? So you need those, I don't want to call them negative people, that those challenges around us as well to make us think hard. Yes. Only when somebody protests do we wonder why and then actually maybe take an interest in that protest because sometimes there's a good reason to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. We've got a, another question here. Are oh, we going back to pod teams? <coughs> Sorry. It sounds like the concept of pod teams are dedicated data teams to support each system or each line of business. That makes sense, Liz. Have you seen much of this or do you think we need more of it? <sighs> the reason why I'm... <laughs> I'd like to see more of it, but it's a challenge. I think we've got a long way to go. I predominantly think this is data mesh related. Now, the challenge here is data mesh is still new. It's hype. 
and the whole world of data suffers from hype. It's on that hype train and it runs at a million miles an hour. Three or four years ago, we were all talking about data culture, every conference, every panel. How do we sort data culture out? How do we mature our <laughs> data culture? What can we do? Now you don't hear about it because people are just like, yeah, OK, we do data literacy. We need to do this. We need to do that. It's more accepted that we know what to do and how to do it. Then we had data catalog. Oh, everybody wants a data catalog. Yeah, but why? Just because you've got a list of all your data, it doesn't mean the data is any good or you can use it any better. You actually knew where your data was before you invested all that money in a data catalog. And now you're like, OK, I've got a list, but it's still crap data. And then we've got data mesh. And the whole hype around that has exploded beyond ridiculousness. But I like the organizational approach from it and taking inspiration from that organizational approach and starting with that pod of people. Maybe it's centrally as you start to build and develop maturity. Yes, I think that works. And I think that is the right approach for organizations because it recognizes the business own the data. They're the experts and they have the accountability and responsibility for making sure that the rest of the business can use that data for the success of the larger business. And when you were talking before about having something that you can go and have a chat to and say, I'm not sure about this, <clears throat> within, the, within the pod teams, would you put something like that as sort of a go-to person? that would bring the cultural side of it together or would you keep that separate? No, I think you need that cultural side in all those people. If they're going to be the experts and the supporters and have data in their title, they should all be advocates of what's going on and what's happening and how they manage that data. Okay, cool. And, it, oh, I assume, I assume these dedicated data teams would coordinate with data teams from other lines of business to make a data fabric architecture work? Uh, we've gone, for, I thought the start of the question was about the people, but we've gone down the technology route. So I let me answer that in two ways. Yeah. Um, so those people need to work together. Absolutely. That's why you have that federation, that data governance committee, which should be a very positive, actionable committee, not just sitting there listening to one person for an hour or however long it might last. It needs to be really proactive and people discussing challenges and how they get around those challenges to make things better. So, yes, they all need to collaborate. They all need to work together. It so, uh, um, goes back to my connected silos. Let's talk to each other. The technology. Well, the IT team would provide the technology that allows you to create your data products, maintain them, and make sure they're fit for purpose. So your data quality <coughs> solutions, your virtualization layers, so analytics can access it, the analytics tools, and all those things. Does that okay. answer that question? <coughs> I'm not, not entirely sure. I think so, yes. I'm waiting to see if there's a follow-on from that. But yes, I mean, I think that's more technical. Oh, one of our users is just saying they're going to watch later. They need to go now. Thanks, Liz and Catherine. Great session. So don't forget to watch us later. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and yes, uh, the answer to that question. That's great, Liz. Thank you for answering that one. OK, so yes, it, it did go a bit often to the technical side, but I think from the questions we've had today and thank you to everyone to see if there's any extras pop up if not not a problem um is that yes it's technical yes it's it but at the end underneath it and underneath technical there are people and it's the people that we need to um be working with to drive cultural change the technology will come and work properly when the people um have understood it. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Um, one thing to think about, or I was thinking about this, what the, I like analogies for data because we need to make data relatable. And I was trying to work out how you explain about data culture and why it needs things to be done. Because 
data culture is about things you can't see. It's those beliefs, those behaviors. You can't actually see them going on, but you know it's happening. And if you think about technology skills, so training people to do presentations, training people how to use systems, we do all of that when they start a job or when they join a company, we offer training. But do we offer training in data for those beliefs, the behaviors of how we want people to interact with the data and use the data? That's where I think the gap is. And that's where I think data literacy can really help fill that gap and help people feel confident, curious and challenging around the data. Because if you give Sarah a list of data and say, here's your report, Sarah goes, yeah, fine, thanks, and goes and make a decision, you need Sarah to be confident, to be curious about that data and challenge it and saying, is it right? Is it giving me the right information that I'm going to make the right decision based on that data? I think that's a great analogy. But then I do like your analogies, I have to say. Uh, because I'm not from a data background. Um, I'm not, which most people that watch my webinars know. So on every one of these webinars, I hear different ways of putting it. And some of them, I think, oh, yes, you know, you've actually made that make sense to me. And uh, you know, for which I'm always grateful. But no, that's brilliant. We haven't got any more questions coming now, Liz. But on going back to the uh, main title, how would you wrap up your summary um, for everybody watching later and online now? So we've amassed a lot of data. We've invested in technology heavily. And we have paid handsomely for those data experts, that analytical talent, those data scientists in their little black box. Yet data culture still remains elusive. We need to really help and support organizations to evolve that maturity in data culture with the behaviors and the beliefs. So we can actually achieve results and insights to drive organizations forward. So they realize that investment is actually going to benefit them. I think that's a, a great summary. I know I really do. I mean, I speak to people every day who have the issues with the data. They're not senior. And the culture of the company is saying to them, just go and sort it out. And they can't because they don't have the support up here in order to drive that business change. So I know that there's a few of them online that we're talking to at the moment, um, and you know who you are, who will be watching this <laughs> and saying, yes, Catherine, how do I get them to get understand this? Because they've got the problem. Um, but no, that's brilliant. Liz, I very much appreciate your time today. Uh, you're an exceptional talent in your field. And we appreciate so much you joining us. I hope it's been great for you. And some of those <laughs> questions weren't too bad. No, I've, I'm not sweating anymore. It's fine. No, I've really enjoyed it, actually. And it's lovely to hear those questions. It just, like I say, it, it makes me think, makes me challenge my own beliefs and understanding. So it's been fantastic. Because thank you, everybody, for all your wonderful questions. And thank you, Catherine, for your time. Indeed. No, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And Liz, I hope we do see you back here again soon in the so future. And uh, again, thanks for everybody for watching the Wimpure webinar today. Hope you enjoyed it. And you'll be tuning in next month for our next session. Um, the title hasn't been released yet, so I can't give you um, an update on that. But you will be getting an email in your inbox, I'm quite sure. Liz, once again, very much appreciate your time today. Thank you for joining us. And thank you. Bye to the audience. Thank <laughs> you.